Welcome everybody to Sessions with Flow. I am your host and today we will be talking about the foundation of Los Angeles. So when I was younger, as probably a lot of you probably went through, you hear about the missions in California and you think, oh, the Spanish came and conquered the area just like the rest of New Spain or Latin America. But California and really the Southwest was a little different when it came to how when it came to how it was colonized. So we will get into detail, more specifically LA, how LA was colonized. So let's get into it. When it comes to the founding of Los Angeles, many people don't realize that the founders were actually people that we would consider from the lower classes today, right? Uh, There's this misconception that Los Angeles was founded by pure-blooded Spaniards or just Spaniards in general, but that wasn't the case. On September 4th, 1781, two years before the end of the American Revolution, the town was actually settled by 44 settlers from the modern states of Sonora and Sinaloa. So the specific breakdown of the 22 uh, women and men, not counting their children, was the following. So you had one peninsular, that means somebody who was born in Spain, one criollo, somebody who was born in New Spain but was of pure Spanish blood, you had one mestizo, a person of mixed Spanish and native blood, two negros, uh, two people of full blood full blood uh, African ancestry, eight mulatos, those who are mixed with Spanish and black, and nine indios, native peoples, obviously, and of course, their children. So off the bat, Los Angeles is pretty diverse, or mainly native and African, right? Again, this is not something that's commonly known. Most people think that LA was founded by, you know, pure-blooded Spaniards. At least that's what I thought, you know, when I first learned about the history of the missions in California and whatnot, right? So these individuals moved from, again, the following states of Sonora and Sinaloa, and you would think to yourself, well, why would anybody want to make that trip? This is way before they had cars or airplanes or whatever. And even if they were going through horses, with horses, it was approximately about 2,000-mile walk. So you can only imagine the people who did this really felt the motivation to do it, right? As today, a lot of immigrants will leave Mexico, Central America to come to the United States, LA specifically in many cases. So this has been going on for a very long time. So what were their motivations? Why would they want to move here with so many factors, right? They had had to find this place. They had to create a city, a, a, a town, and a place that was inhabited by people, right, native peoples, but there was no cities at the time. So they were going to be dealing with a lot of things that they didn't have to deal with back at home. So one of the reasons why these individuals left was because non-Spaniards in New Spain, obviously, had little to no opportunities. So the move offered new avenues for people from Las Castas, people of color in New Spain. New Spain. So since the majority of the pobladores were of native and African descent, the migration of 2,000 miles was worth it, right? As a matter of fact, some of these individuals became large state owners and very wealthy. If they would have stayed in Sonora and Sinaloa or just northern Mexico, this was, this was never going to be the case. Because again, if you were not of pure Spanish blood in New Spain, your opportunities were very limited. You were either going to be some kind of unskilled farm worker, do a lot of hard labor. And this was an opportunity for folks to leave that and try something new because they were going to be rewarded, right? Again, not everybody became wealthy, not everybody became a huge landowner, but some did. And not only that, but as they became wealthy, they had the ability to climb up the caste system, Again, so this is why in Latin America, color and colorism are very, very prevalent because it was all about moving up the caste system, going back to when it first started. 
it was very difficult to do that unless you had very, very good connections. But one of the ways to do that was through wealth, right? So if a mestizo was able to reinvent themselves in Los Angeles, then they could move up to Criollo. In some cases, even, you know, uh, Peninsula, probably not, but more than likely Criollo, right? And again, that, that meant new privileges, new opportunities. And for blacks and natives, they would move up to being mestizos or mulatos again. That little bit of Spanish blood gave them more privileges because now they were considered somewhat likable, somewhat worth in this society according to these laws that they had in New Spain. And in hindsight, you might think, wow, why would these people deny their African or native ancestry? Well, this is why, because they were not offered the same opportunities if they had this type of ancestry or if they recognized it or if they acknowledged it. The move to assimilate to a Spanish society was what many people would do during this time, which ultimately contribute, contributed to why a lot of us don't know much about our native or African ancestry. It was happening all over Latin America, right? But again, obviously, you had a native population here in Los Angeles, and mixing continued with the population here. They would intermix with the natives here, and so people still had native ancestry. But with that said, because they came from the caste system and because they understood this, you would think, well, they were going to be better with the native population. That was not the case. Many of those who did become very wealthy were no different than the Criollos and the Peninsulares who did that to them, right? They behaved in the same way. So this goes to show you that when you gain power, I mean, we've seen this many, many times in history. If you attain power, you become somewhat you know, oppressive. And this happened again in a place where individuals who came from oppressed groups did exactly that in many, many times. Not always, but, you know, those who gained land had native um, servants or even slaves at some point, right? So how do they, how do these people maintain themselves? They supported themselves uh, and the community through these massive ranches because they were given large, large ranches by the crown of Spain as a reward for populating the town for colonizing the town for making the town more spanish right they understood that the frontier needed to be guarded from other european powers as russia and in cases england as well so that was one of the ways that they were able to uh, sustain themselves However, during the Spanish period, the economy was very stagnant because the Spanish did not allow its uh, subjects to trade with foreign people. It, was, it only had to be with Spanish or other people in New Spain. So the, the wealth would have to come afterwards. And this is exactly what happened during the Mexican period. A lot of those who had been there since the beginning began, began to trade with foreigners more specifically with people from the U.S. who were coming across and just other, other countries that were willing to trade with, with Mexico. And it was a perfect place because, you know, you're, you're right next to the harbor, right? Harbor area, uh, San Pedro, Santa Monica, all these, all these uh, places that are, are next to the beach made it easier for them to trade. And then during the Anglo period when the United States came and took over the area, some of those people actually became even more wealthy because when more migrants became came to this area, they were able to either sell off their land because they understood that the Anglos were looking for land or just made profits off the cowhide or just things that they sold off the ranch. Okay, so that was one of the ways that, or these are some of the ways that the Californios or in this specific case, the Angelinos were able to sustain themselves. And some of these families that were very prominent today, you might recognize them if you live in L.A., right? You have the Picos, who own uh, what is now San Fernando. There was a ranch there. So if you pass through Pico Street, you know, that that is a paying homage to that family. The Sepúlvedas, uh, obviously Sepúlveda is one of those streets that runs pretty much all over L.A. And what is now Palos Verdes used to be called Rancho Palos Verdes. That was the area they occupied. 
uh, the Feliz family, what is now Griffith Park. If you pass through there, you'll see Los Feliz, the, the street. Again, the ranch they own there. The Reyes family in what is now Encino. And lastly, the Tapia family, what is now in Malibu. So these were families that own land, own these large estates, large ranches, and these modern towns, cities, etc. And you might think to yourself, well, what happened to them again? Some of these people sold off some of the land. Some of these people uh, left because they didn't want to be under Anglo control. Or in some cases, like we, we talked about in the previous video, they... Uh, the Americans who came here squatted on their land and they had to sell them because they had lost, they had invested so much money in the court cases, they had no choice but to do that. And uh, again, we, we, we just talked about that right now. Um, one of the things that made it hard for them to keep their land was the constant immigration from the East. More specifically, in what we now know as Rancho La Cienega, where if you've been there, you, you'll uh, go to, uh, there's a couple of museums there. Where you have LACMA, and you have the, man, what is it called? I forgot the name of the, of the, of the museum. But if you go there, you'll, you'll see that there's uh, petroleum coming out of the ground. This brought a ton of immigrants from uh, the east. And unfortunately, this individual was not able to keep up with this, and they lost their land. And uh, Angelinos who did not live in luxu luxurious lives, who had luxurious lives, either chose to leave Los Angeles or intermarried with the incoming Mexican immigrant populations. Again, immigration from Mexico has been happening since the very beginning of when this area was colonized, going back to the 1540s, right? And so those Californios, when they intermarried, they took on Mexican traditions that they've had because, again, most of them only spoke Spanish when the Anglos came. So they just blended with the uh, incoming Mexican population. With that said, though, today there are anywhere from 300 to 500,000 uh, Californios who trace their lineage back to the original settlers of California. So, again, they're not, it's not like they disappeared or you know, anything like that. They just blended with the local Mexican population. And obviously, because of what I just said, their status didn't remain. And if it did, if, if those, who, those who did sell off stuff and kept their stuff, they just kind of blended into, into the uh, American Anglo society. And today, there are folks who probably only speak nothing but English that do come from that, that section. And that concludes today's video. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you learned more about the history of Los Angeles and really just overall California. More importantly, I think it's important to know this because a lot of us are taught that people from our uh, group, specifically those who identify from uh, the castas or native or black or whatever, we had opportunities even back then. The, the only issue is that these individuals obviously chose to uh, deny the roots Today, we have the opportunity to not do that, but still succeed in this country. I think it's important to take. That's what I take from this this uh, this whole course. Uh, but anywho, that concludes today's video. If you want to read more about this, click on the links. On that note, this is Flow. Can't go wrong when you go over to Flow. Peace.